So, hello everybody. My name is uh, Valérie Pena. I'm from the LSC at the Ecole Polytechnique uh, in France. And uh, I will exp explain you what is nonlinear optical spectroscopy and what are the experimental points and uh, how we simu numerically simulate uh, nonlinear uh, processes. So, so, this is the outline. So the first part will be uh, some examples of what we can have as, as processes in nonlinear spectroscopy. And the second part will be devoted to the calculation of these processes and to uh, some examples. So this will be mainly uh, for second order and third order uh, processes. So we start. So the, the idea is to calculate the response to an external perturbation but to go to expand this response in terms of the, of the perturbation and to go beyond the linear term. So, so this is the, the external perturbation. We look at the response and the main quantity that we have to, uh, to simulate is the polarization. The response of the medium will be the polarization which the polarization can be expanded in a part of the external field. So we have the first order, the second order, the third order, and so on. And uh, the, the nonlinear terms can uh, show some new frequencies. As long as we are uh, looking at the linear response, there is no change in the frequency. It means that the response is obtained at the same frequency as uh, the perturbation. When we go beyond uh, the first order, we can have new frequencies. And this is very simple to understand. So the perturbation uh, is written as an oscillating term. It's an electric field. So it goes as a cosine. And the frequency uh, of the, the field is omega. And if you take, for instance, the second order, if you calculate the square of the cosine, you get one term which is static, means at zero frequency, and another term which is at twice the frequency of, uh, of this term, okay? And it goes like this for the third order where we can have a response at omega and a response at three omega and so on. So the linear term, of course, depends linearly on the electric field. So this one is for at the same frequency. But if we use higher term, high intensity for the for the external perturbation, like lasers, uh, the higher order term can be uh, important. So all these terms will be the nonlinear response of the meter. So it, it was uh, discovered quite a, a long time ago. So it's the, the nonlinear optical spectroscopy, in fact, appeared with the discovery of the laser, which was in 1961. Uh, well, 60 for the laser, 61 for the nonlinear spectroscopy. And the first experiment uh, was for second harmonic generation. And Oh, sorry, I have to tell you about that. So, well, just a reminder of what is uh, a laser. So, the laser stands for light amplification by simulated emission of radiation. The important points for the laser is the spatial coherence, the temporal coherence, and the high intensity. It's because we can have intense collimated monochromatic beam, and that's very important to get high intensity uh, beams. So the direction of the beam, so that's to, just to show you the collimated beam. If you take an ordinary source, like a normal light, the, the light is emitted in all directions. The laser goes straight and we have a light which is completely in the same direction and this will happen for a very long distance. It's not that the divergence of the beam is so small that it goes as a collimated beam for very, very long. So that's important if you want to perform an experiment. 
The other point is the mono monochromatic light. It means that the beam has only one frequency. No, not so. But that's really the theoretical point of view. In real life, it's not exactly monochromatic. And if you compare what I call the theoretical spectrum, where we have, we have a kind of delta function for the, for the light, and the real spectrum, you see that it's not completely monochromatic. In fact, there is a, a, a width of the, of the spectrum. And uh, we have this width. It's due to the, the uncertainty relation of Heisenberg. The idea of the laser, it's a, a pulse laser. So we have a finite duration for the light, which means that if we have a delta T, the, the emission of light, which is uh, short. And so that it will increase the width of the, uh, of the, the color of the, of the beam. So we have uh, some, something like this. So delta lambda is related to delta T. Delta T is the duration of the, of the beam. Uh, so we have, let me show you, if we just take a normal light, we have this kind of spectrum. So you see that it's very broad. It's, it's a bit smaller if we go to some tube, neon tube have a, a smaller bandwidth. And we have the laser and we have different type of laser, so different colors. The usual one are red light. We can go up to blue light with a short laser burst, but not really, for, not really further. So all the colors for the, for the laser are not accessible to, to experiment. So that's the, 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 the first experiment that was performed. So it's related to second harmonic generation. So this is the idea of the, the experiment. You use the, the, the beam, so it was a ruby laser, which is more or less red. And it was uh, sent in a, in a sample, which was a quartz sample. And they looked at the light was, which was emitted uh, from the sample. So of course we had the, also the incoming uh, light, but there was something there uh, a bit further. And at the beginning, they did not notice anything. In fact, the second order, of course, is much smaller, much less intense than the linear response. So uh, the, 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 what you get is a very weak signal, or you increase the intensity of the light. But when they saw the, the result of the experiment, they looked at something there, and there was they could not see anything. Instead of something which was first understood as a defect, in fact, in the film. It's only a bit later that they realized that it was the first signature of a nonlinear process. And so it was, it was here. And so this was the incoming uh, frequency at 1.8 dV. And the second are harmonic, which is at 3.6. So just doubling the, the frequency. So we will start with second harmonic generation. So the idea is very simple. You have uh, the incoming frequency in a nonlinear medium, and then you get the incoming frequency and twice. So the process is like this. The medium will absorb two photons and will emit one photon. And for uh, energy conservation, the energy that is emitted is twice the incoming frequency. And so this, the, the, we, you start from the ground state and you go back to the ground state. The amplitude of the process, so is given by this term. And so the, the linear term, we have something which is much uh, smaller. So the square of the electric field multiplied by a con uh, quantity that is called the susceptibility, second order susceptibility, which is also much larger than the third order term. So this is the first nonlinear term, but in some cases, this term can be equal to zero. And this depends on the, the symmetry of the material. 
because it can be shown that if the material is central symmetric, then the chi2, the second order susceptibility, is really zero in the dipole approximation. So it means that in that case, the first nonlinear term will be the third one. And the fact that uh, the, 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 the susceptibility is zero is not only true for the second order, it will be true for all the even terms, so chi four, chi six, and, and so on. And this is uh, true only in the dipole approximation. If you go below dipole approximation, I mean, if you go to a high, very high frequency, it really remain very small, not zero, but small. Uh, so, uh, second, uh, second harmonic generation is just doubling the frequency, but we, in the general case, we have, can have more frequencies. Imagine that you have two fields, one at frequency omega 1 and one at frequency omega 2. So, we have the, the electric field, so uh, the, is the sum of these two terms, and we will mix all the frequencies. So, we can have second harmonic generation, so two omega one or two omega two, because we have the two frequencies. We can have some frequency generation. It means that we have a response at omega one plus omega two, but we can also have difference frequency generation. So we have omega one minus omega two. Here, there is a small point of notation. The, the field is real. So when we say that we have omega one, which is uh, I lost the pointer. Okay, so I lost the you point. can use the mouse. I know, I know because uh, yeah. okay, I put it here for the moment. <laughs> so we have the exponential minus i omega one. But because the field is real, we have the complex conjugate of this term. So in, a, in an electric field, uh, we have omega one or minus omega one. One term is responsible for the absorption, the other term is responsible for the emission, okay? So I will always speak about omega, but remember that we have omega and minus omega, so we can have absorption or emission. And so we can have some frequency, omega one plus omega two, but we can have also omega one minus omega two. So any ask a question? Sure. So usually I always see a photon harmonic solution when the photon uh, frequency is of less month but with the it's not less month with the transition. It, 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 can, it can be. It can be in resonance. Uh, in the in the previous slide, in fact, it was not in resonance. It's dashed line, which means that in fact it's a virtual state. If it is in resonance, uh, it's, you will get a very high signal compared to a non-resonance. So basically, it's no longer through the expansion in uh, the Taylor expansion of the field, but still the physics uh, is kind of the same. Yes, yes, yeah, it does not change. I mean, it's. Uh, we will see it on the on the on the analytical expression of the of the guy too. Okay. But it can be in resonance. It can be in resonance for the final states. I mean, when you absorb two omega, if you go to a, a, a real state, then it is resonance. But it can be also at the intermediate level, where one the absorption of one photon is resonant, and then the second one is not resonant, or both. You have you can have processes in which both are in resonance, and then that will enhance a lot uh, the signal. But this depends so on the process. It, it, it does not happen very often that it is. Oh, well, you really have to, to tune the frequency very, very carefully if you want to be part of it. So that's the uh, schematic view of uh, the different process. So we have uh, the, the, income, the two incoming fields, uh, second harmonic, second harmonic in between some frequency and here the difference between the two frequencies. So that's typical, the kind of uh, thing that you can see. Uh, so the same uh, here, 
So here we have the sound frequencies. So you see that in that case, the two frequencies are different. And this one, which corresponds to the emission, so we have an absorption of this omega-1 uh, photon. The, the other one is emis, uh, emitted, so it is what is called simulated emission because we we emit a, pho a photon that is already present in the in the field, and this one, which is the resulting process. There are another type of uh, second order processes, which uh, that is strange was in fact discovered be before the invention of the laser. It's the second process uh, with a static field. So it is considered as a second process because a static field uh, can be seen as a, a field with a photon that have a zero frequency. Okay, if you take the expression of the, of the electric field I showed you just uh, in, in the previous slide, which is cosine of omega t. Okay? If omega is equal to zero, then we have something which is constant in time, which is the static field. So the static field can be seen as an electric field at zero frequency. And it was, uh, it was discovered in, you see, very long time ago at the end of the 19th century, that the property <laughs> oh, where are you? What happened? Okay. Uh, the, the optical properties of a material could be modified by the presence of a static field. So it was the, the experiment was uh, done like this. We have a material in a condensator or be between two electrons that will create a field, a static field inside the material. And by looking at the optical response, in that case, the linear response, it was uh, modified uh, by the presence of this static field. Uh, and so it is, uh, the result is here. So this is the, uh, the index, the refractive index of the material, which was uh, changing linearly with the applied static field. And you can describe it as a nonlinear process because it's a second order response. In that case, it's not at the same frequency, not like what we had for second order. So omega, omega gives to omega, okay. but omega plus zero, and the response is at omega. And so it's a second order. So a chi two, zero omega and the emission of omega and multiplied by the field at frequency omega and the field at frequency omega equals zero. So it's, it's called electro-optic effect and it's used in some, it has a lot of uh, applications. For second harmony, the, the application are, are quite uh, important. It is uh, a probe for materials because it's very sensitive to the local symmetries inside the material. It can, use, it can be used as a probe. Uh, so for instance, uh, to probe surfaces, thin films, interfaces, nanowires, and, and so on. And uh, it, it gives also access to different electronic transitions compared to the linear case, because we, we absorb two photons, so we can go higher in states. We can go high, uh, to, to different frequencies, because when you know that when you, the, the material absorbs a photon, the frequency, the, uh, the angular momentum of the, of the photon uh, is, there, let's put it together, there is a, a, an angular momentum that is carried by the photon. So, if you absorb two photons, you have access to other states with different um, uh, angular momentum. And uh, so this is applied to, to, as a probe. So for instance, uh, in, uh, in chemistry, in molecules, you can, or in nanotubes, so for surface reconstructions, this is very important. And also in biology, uh, in, experiment because some uh, tissues have uh, non-central symmetry like uh, uh, collagen and this, this, this kind of tissues. And uh, second harmonic is widely used in, in this case. There is other developments uh, and it's, it's important to, to create new optical devices 
And then there we go back to lasers because we people try to expand the number of frequencies that are available for non-second uh, second uh, harmonic generation. For instance, I know this one has no color, but the previous pointer was red. If you use a pointer that is green, it's just that a pointer where you have second harmonic generation because if you double the frequency, you go to red from the, from red to green. So that's the, the really simplest uh, application of second harmonic generation. And also uh, for uh, other applications, um, you know that silicon is a very uh, technological material that is very important. We have a lot of silicon. We use a lot of silicon in electronics. Unfortunately, silicon is central symmetric. So there is, in principle, nothing to do with silicon for uh, nonlinear uh, second order processes. Here it is. This you mean? Uh, yeah, this one. This one is great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but it, it would be very important if we were able to, to use silicon for applications in, in photonics. And, and one way is, uh, for instance, is to strain the silicon, so we just compress it, and we break the symmetry inside the silicon, and then silicon can be a nonlinear medium for second, second harmonic. So that's one of the, of the applications. And more recently, uh, second harmonic time, in that case, time resolved second harmonic generation was used uh, to uh, probe the ultra fast demagnetization. The uh, ultra fast demagnetization, the idea is to use it to have uh, very fast memories based on magnetic materials. And it was realized that although uh, demagnetization was expected to be a quite slow process. It is much more, much faster uh, than what was expected. And that was uh, discovered by uh, using second harmony generation to follow in time the demagnetization process, which can change the symmetry of the material. OK, let's go to third order now. So third order, uh, you have much more terms because you can have three frequencies, mixture, so, okay. So <laughs> you can have the incoming frequency, third harmonic generation, sum frequency generation, difference, a sum and a difference, the same frequency that is absorbed twice and another one, which is the third photon, Difference frequency with two omega minus another one, and so on. So you have a lot of different uh, processes. And uh, like that. so the third harmonic generation is uh, written like this. So you exactly the same as for the second. You absorb three photon and you emit one. But there was there is another one. Well, I told you that we have new frequencies. In the third order process, we can recover the same frequency because if you, you absorb, emit, absorb, you go back to the incoming, fre uh, incoming frequency. And uh, in that case, if you sum up the terms, you will see that you have one term which is proportional to the electric field and one which is proportional to the third power of the electric field. In that case, it will add and go in the refraction index. So the refraction index, you uh, you factorize the, the amplitude of the electric field, and you are le left with one term, which is just the normal refractive index, plus another one, which is proportional to the intensity of the field. Intensity of the field is the square of the electric field. And so you have a new term in the, in, the, in the refractive index, which depends on the intensity. And in fact, this term is responsible for what we call self-focusing. It means that if you have only the refractive index because you, it's very collimated, it goes straight. And due to this intensity dependent field, it will focus. And this could be important to increase the intensity, but it can be, uh, a source of damage 
because you really increase the intensity and then you go to the field to, to the uh, the range of uh, electrical breakdown you can destroy the material because you you, uh, you did not expect the intensity to be so high and then the intensity is increasing in increasing due to this term and just destroy the material okay so i will not go to the fourth term because the way we count is one two three a lot and so i will not tell you about the first the fourth and fifth order but we will go directly to a lot of photons and what this is what is called high harm, high order harmonic generation and uh it was discovered in the in the 80s mid 80s mainly with atoms at the beginning and uh people used to to send a laser a very intense laser the laser in that case and look at the light which was emitted and they discovered that they had all the frequencies uh, um, multiple odd multiple of the incoming frequency so omega three omega five omega and so on uh, at some time the, the the highest frequency was 400 harmonics which is a lot but I think it's still uh, still increasing, and so that's a, that's the kind of spectrum that they they, they got so lines with the uh, two omega in, in between, and they had uh, uh, the, a, spe a special shape which turned out to be quite general. Is this so at the beginning a fast decrease of the harmonics, and then a plateau where more or less all the harmonics had the same, were emitted with the same intensity, which clearly shows that we are not anymore in the perturbative, in the perturbative regime, because in the perturbative regime, as it goes in power of the electric field, it, it will decrease. Here we have everything at the same level. So we are not anymore in a, in a regime where we can expand in perturbations uh, expansion the, the response of the uh, of the material and after the plateau a shock cut off and this is Sorry, could you repeat again uh, why the plateau means that we're well, not anymore in the normal it, it is based on the fact that we, we have a response that depends on of course the intensity of the incoming field and when you expand the response in terms of the electric field if you if you cut somewhere it means that the other terms are, are not important mm -hmm. it's just like the the, the development in, in power of some terms uh, and it means that it goes decreasing it means if you if you stop somewhere it means that all the terms that you do not take into account are smaller mm -hmm. so for instance if we stop at the third power it means that four five six and so on are negligible and so if you look at the intensity of the process, of the different process, uh, you will see that the first order is high, the second one is a bit lower, third is a bit lower, and the fourth one disappears. When you, when you have something which is at the, where, where all the terms are at the same level, you cannot cut the expansion. And so you have to, to calculate all the orders and sum all the terms. It's not anymore perturbation expansion. Sorry. So this means that uh, uh, the, um, the fifth, the sixth, and so on are negligible, and you can stop at the fourth. Yes, for instance. Yeah, if you do a perturbation. You are yeah. mm, Yes. Yeah. And in that case, uh, just the, the the here it could simulate. Uh, um, a perturbative expansion, but the fact that we have the plateau means that all the terms have to be uh, accounted for. Yeah. In fact, some people did the calculations uh, in the in the perturbative uh, way, and uh, by comparing with the experiment, it was completely wrong. Uh, I would add that from the, the, the theoretical point of view, if you want to uh, calculate the, the, let's say, the 50th harmonic, it's much easier to calculate everything than doing a perturbative calculation to order 50. I would not. Uh, 
do that. Okay, so now we go to the to the calculation because this was more the experimental uh, point of view, and uh, we will uh, start with the different theoretical methods. I will only show you one. So we have the uh, perturbative expansion and the non-perturbative expansion. So I just divided the methods in, in these two, uh, two, two ways. If we start with the non-perturbative expansion, I will not say anything uh, about that, but uh, you will have the talk of Claudio Atacarite on, fr on Friday, my card on Friday, and uh, it's done through an explicit uh, time propagation. So you will see that on, on Friday. And there is the uh, perturbative expansion. Today, we will look at this expansion in terms of TDDFT, so time, de uh, time dependent density functional theory. There are other uh, approaches than the one I will uh, show you today. One is uh, based on the finite differences. It means, in fact, that uh, it's for static processes, so the one with uh, omega equals zero. It is implemented in, in Abinit. Uh, and the idea in that case is to uh, calculate the energy of the material uh, because it's a static field, so it, you can use TFT, for instance. You calculate the energy of the material and uh, you differentiate it in respect to the, in the electric field. And that gives you all the terms which are static in that case. Uh, there is also the Sternheimer equation, which is uh, based on the 2n plus 1 theorem. And in that case, you have the, the, the dynamical response. By dynamical response, I mean the frequency, it, the, the response in terms of the frequency. And uh, it was done also with the beta salpeta equation that you will see also, I think, on Friday. So Francesco will tell you about uh, this equation for the linear case. But some people have uh, extended the beta salpeta equation to the second order. But I have to tell you that it is a huge work to uh, do the beta salpeta equation to second order. It's really, it's really awful, <laughs> awful, difficult. One, one question. Can we include also the Feynman path formalism in one of those methods? Uh, I, I did not get the beginning. Uh, the Feynman path uh, formalism, I know, has been used also to treat this kind of what? Feynman path formalism. Path uh, the not in a initial calculation. I mean, it's it's more a way to uh, to describe it. I mean, analytically, but I. For, for the for the instant, the second order, I don't I mean, at the end, would you will... I saw the works of uh, this one man, Wilson Baker from Software Institute. I, I think he did the same calculation using the class formalism. Yeah, but for atoms. Okay, not for... Yeah, formalism. for atoms. Yeah. Yeah. It's very different. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, in fact, it's, it's, let's say, it's simpler. With atoms, uh, because you 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 can use a, 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 what we call a single active electron approximation. Mm -hmm. You see, we, uh, so in, in atoms, uh, harmonic generation is really a one electron process. So you can really use models in which all the electrons are frozen, and just one electron is doing the job. In that case. Uh, you can uh, rely on more uh, complicated formalism. In the solids, all the electrons are inside the solid. I mean, a, a single active electron model is really... And then you have to, to, to stick to uh, different formalism. So it's not really that it is more difficult or simpler. It's just that you can describe the, mod the, the, the process in terms of in, in terms of different ways. But can we compare somehow uh, the higher mode generation spectrum of a molecule with a higher mode generation spectrum of a solid? Are they qualitatively? Well, the, the principle is the same. I mean, you will have peaks at the different frequencies. 
the, the, they, are, they are a bit different because usually in solids, you can have also the, the second order terms or the even order terms in solids. Uh, because if you take, uh, for instance, gallium arsenide, there is no central symmetry. So you, ha you will have omega 2, omega 3, omega, and, and so on. While in, uh, in atoms, usually they are central symmetric. Mm -hmm. So you have only 1, 3, 5, and so on. But there is another difference is the fact that you can use high, uh, higher intensity in atoms than in solids, because in, in solids, usually, if you use the same intensity, you will just destroy the, the, the solid. So you, you are restricted to smaller intensities. And you will never get with a solid 400 harmonics. You will, after 11, 12, it's, it's, you don't see a lot of harmonics. But basically, and I think the shape of the spectrum is also a bit different, a bit different because you don't have this shape with the the, 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 the decrease, the plateau. It's difficult to see a plateau in solid. Mm -hmm. But after that, it, it's harmonic, so absorption of photons yeah, and okay, but emission. Have, but yeah, but the shape, the shape is, dif is different. It's difficult to say whether there is no plateau or if the intensity is not high enough that we can reach the plateau. Yeah, maybe that. It's, it's, uh, it's different. Okay. That's it. Okay, so uh, second order TGTFT. So the, the, the quantity, so the quantity that we have to, to calculate is uh, the macroscopic polarization of the medium. And it is included uh, in the displacement vector, so the vector which we usually call D. For the linear case, you have seen that yesterday, uh, it is written in terms of the total electric field multiplied by a quantity epsilon, which is the macroscopic dielectric uh, tensor. And this uh, macroscopic dielectric tensor is given by chi one, uh, which is the linear susceptibility. If we go to second order, then we have an extra term in the displacement vector, which is the macroscopic second order susceptibility. And this, uh, this term, PM2, is written uh, in this way. So we have twice the total electric field and this quantity, chi2, which is a function of omega one and omega two, which of course can be equal, which are the incoming frequencies. And so here there is a, a, another point of notation, minus omega one, minus omega two, it's written like this. It just means that it is the frequency that is emitted. So we, we the, the material absorb omega one, omega two, and emit the sum of the two. If here we had minus omega one, we would have omega one minus omega two. So that would be the process described by uh, difference frequency generation. Okay, so all the processes can be included here. And uh, the, the goal is to calculate this quantity within a TTTFT, so an ab initio format. Uh, I will, because you, 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 you saw yesterday the, the first order calculation, I will always refer to the, to the first order so that you follow the link between first order and second order. So for the linear uh, calculation, we have to calculate uh, the response function, which is the functional derivative. So remember that it is TGTFT now, which is the functional <coughs> derivative of the density with respect to the external uh, perturbation, the, the external potential. And once we have this quantity that maybe was called chi one yesterday. Yeah, chi so it was called chi one. The, and now it's called chi rho rho. So 
the density response function because we will use the guy rho, rho, rho for, the, for the next step. And once we have this guy rho, rho we can uh, calculate the dielectric susceptibility like this, the, the, this expression that you have seen yes, uh, yesterday. So to second order, we will have the, uh, sec the functional second derivative of the density with respect uh, to the external potential. So now it's a, a, a function that depends on R or prime R second because the density depends on R. The two potential depends on R prime and R second. And we have the true frequency. Um, sorry, I think there is a mistake here. Here it's omega plus omega prime, sorry. So one potential is at omega. The second one is at omega prime and we have this new frequency. So the, macro, the second order macroscopic susceptibility, which is the, the analog of the dielectric susceptibility, uh, dielectric tensor, sorry, is written here. And so the, the, the link between the response function and the macroscopic susceptibility is a bit different depending the order, second order or first order. Here, the macroscopic susceptibility is expressed in terms of the response function, which is expected because that's this quantity. So it was appearing here for the, in our case, it's appearing here for the second order, but it's also, it depends also on linear terms. So the response function is multiplied by the dielectric susceptibility at frequency omega, at frequency omega prime and frequency omega plus omega prime. So every time that you do a calculation at second order, you will have to perform at the same time the calculation of the linear response function for all the frequencies that are involved in the, in the process, which is done in fact at the, at the same time in the So now how we, do we, uh, calculate the response function. So we have to first order a Dyson equation that has to be solved. So the Dyson equation depends on a non-interacting response function, the Kuhn-Sham response function, and on two terms, one is the Coulomb potential and the exchange correlation formula <coughs> that is supposed to incorporate all the, 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 the exchange and the correlation in the in the, inside the materials. And it is the uh, functional derivative of the exchange correlation potential with respect to the density. Of course, uh, we have the same at second order, just a, a bit longer. So we have the chi 2 the quantity we want to calculate. The non-interacting response function to second order, and I will show you later the, the or what is this function? Something which is very similar with the, the, the Coulomb potential and the same kernel that appeared uh, in, the, in the first order Dyson equation. And that's very important. It means that we can use all the work that was done for the linear case to the second order. All the approximation that have been derived for this kernel can be used just like this for the, for the, second, uh, the second order. It's just that the equation is a bit more complicated because it goes with the square of this term because we have the, the two fields. And there is an extra term, which is depend on this GXC, uh, which is the second the functional derivative to second order of the exchange, for the exchange correlation potential. So we have the first order derivative FXC, and the second order derivative, GXC. Uh, at this point, I have to admit that there is, for the moment, no approximation for the GXC. Uh, there is, we have approximations for the VX, for the FXC, and in uh, in calculations, usually we put GXC equal to zero. 
which is the best we can do for the moment. So what is the scheme for uh, um, a calculation? We first perform a, a, a ground state calculation in the framework of uh, static TFT so that is done uh, with Abinit. And we have at this point to uh, choose which VXC will be used uh, for the description of the ground state properties. Then with all the quantities that have been calculated uh, at this point, we will uh, calculate the uh, non-interacting uh, response function that gives us the independent particle approximation, the IPA, which at the same level of, for the linear response. Then we solve the Dyson equation. And so we have to decide which FXC, which GXC we uh, use for solving the Dyson equation. And from this, we get uh, the macroscopic susceptibility. And this, uh, this scheme has been incorporated in a code that you will uh, use uh, this afternoon, uh, which is called to light. And uh, we will play with it uh, this, this afternoon. So what is the uh, second order response function in real life? Something like uh, something like this. Uh, so there is uh, well, it's it's I, I admit a complicated formula, but just to show you the the basic things that are in the formula, we have maybe if I go there, it's easier. Can you can you yeah can you see? So you you see that we have matrix elements, like in the linear case. The difference is in the linear case we have two matrix elements. In the second order, we have three. One here and here. So this one is multiplying everything. So one, two, three. So we have three matrix elements. And we have energy denominators. And we have two energy denominators. One here and one here. Okay. And this is related to the fact that we have two ways of having uh, resonant processes. They are uh, seen here. We have a resonant processes, well, uh, process when the frequency of the field is such that one of these terms is equal to zero. These are the energy of the states inside the, inside the material. So if omega is equal minus the difference of this term, this denominator is zero, and we have a, a, a resonant process. We can also have this term that would be equal to zero. But here you see that we have a two omega. That's the signature of the second harmonic generation. In that case, it means that is the final virtual state, the second virtual state that, we, that is resonant. Okay, so we have different kind of uh, resonant processes. And this will be seen in the spectra because usually we have two peaks. One peak, which is at the same energy position as the linear response, and one which is at half the, 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 we say, in the middle of the gap, in fact, okay? And so that's this quantity that we have to calculate to, to get the, the second order. We are in the, we work in the dipole approximation because the light is in the infrared visible range. So usually we, we have, uh, the, the dipole approximation, it means that this quantity Q, go, they go to zero. We could do the calculation like this, it's taking a very small value for, for Q. The problem is that it's different, <coughs> sorry, numerically uh, difficult to do the, the calculation because you have, there, there are compensations between all the terms. And it's difficult to converge in, term, in terms of Q. So what we did is we did the, the analytical limit Q goes to zero. And finally, what we have is something like this, where it's not the exponential that, are, that appear in, the, in the, the, the matrix element, it's just this quantity QR. And so it's directly the limit Q goes to zero. Uh, of course, if you say just Q goes to zero, 
you get zero, but it's divided by term one of the Q. So at the end, we have something which is finite. Uh, the problem is that when we perform the analytical limits, Q goes to zero. The formula, this one, which was already quite complicated, we have more and more terms. So I only show two of them. There are others uh, that have to be calculated, but finally the structure for all the terms is more or less the same. We have these three matrix elements and these kind of denominators to omega and uh, omega. And so that is this kind of formula that have been implemented in, in the code. So now I will, uh, I will show you some, some example. The first one is for silicon carbide. So silicon carbide is a non-central uh, symmetric material. And uh, I show you uh, this case just to um, show you the effect of the scissor approximation. Unfortunately, do, did you, do you have already seen the GW calculation? No, okay. Uh, so just to, to you, you will have the, the Matteo, do you, will it be this morning about the GW calculation? Uh, tomorrow. Ah, tomorrow. So you have to, to, to wait until tomorrow. But the problem with DFT is the fact that we don't have the correct gap. And this gap has to be uh, corrected by the uh, GW approximation just to open the gap. Because it's important in our uh, expression that at the, 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 ener the energies of the material are correct. Otherwise, we don't have resonant processors at the correct energy in that kind of thing. So we have to open the gap. And one way to do that is to use a scissor approximation in which all the valence, uh, I'm spoiling a little bit the, the rest of the rest of the, of the course, but in which the valence states have this keep the same energy and the conduction states have a higher energy. If you do, if you do so in a linear uh, calculation, you will see that the peak will shift towards uh, larger energy. So that's here, the result of the linear response. Uh, in green, we don't have any scissor and in red, we shift the conduction. Band. So you see that the, 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 the peak is uh, shifted. If we do the same, and we will do the same for second harmonic generation, the effect is not only a, a, a shift. Uh, we, we, we change the shape, we really change the shape of the, spect of, the, of the spectrum because we have this mixing of the different energy at the denominator. We do, because of the two omega and omega, they don't move in the same way. So we really have a difference in the, in the, in the spectrum. Now, if we go to uh, another material, so gallium arsenide is, is uh, very important for us. When we, us in the, in the sense that when you, we do a numerical calculation, because that's more or less the only material where we have very precise uh, frequency dependent second harmonic generation. And so that was uh, really uh, an important point to be able to calculate gallium arsenide to test our, our formalism, because that's really where we have the, the most precise result. And so this, uh, these are the experimental points. And the, the red curve is the result of the independent particle approximation. You see that uh, it's not really successful. Well, it's the same order of magnitude. That's, a good point, but we cannot say really that uh, we, we have all the peaks, all the features. Uh, so we thought that it's uh, mandatory to, to go further. And the first uh, thing that we can do is to include the local fields. So we solve the Dyson equation uh, for the second order. And uh, we only keep the Coulomb potential. So for the moment, the exchange correlation kernel is set to zero. So, and we look at the effect of uh, the, the local field. And uh, well, it was a bit disappointing. It was a very long calculation. 
And finally, uh, it's not even better, it's worse. I mean, we decreased the intensity of the, <laughs> of the peak. No. Okay, that's life. Uh, so we, we decided that again, we have to go, we have to go further. And now uh, the, the next uh, approximation is to find a good approximation for FXC. So I will not show you the, the results with LDA. Uh, it was the same as local fields. And so we, we used uh, the long range static kernel, which is uh, done to incorporate the excitonic uh, processes. So it, the, 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 it's written like this. And this coefficient alpha is a coefficient that is material dependent. And uh, our chance in this case was that there was good approximation for gallium arsenide, which are coming from the linear response. And that's, that's why I, I, I said at the beginning that the fact that we have the same kernel in the first order that there is an equation and the second order, uh, that is an equation that we can rely on the work done by our colleague and just take the value of alpha that has been uh, simulated and uh, checked. And so you see that in that case, uh, the result is really much better. We were very, very happy when we had that, uh, that result. And uh, especially because we can have the, we, we, we pick the amplitude of the, uh, the main peak that that was very important for for us to be able to to, sh to show that uh, this main peak is due to an excit an excitonic process. Uh, it's not perfect, that's true, and uh, the difference here and uh, mainly here comes from the fact that in principle the kernel FXC. Oh, sorry, yeah. But then it says, oh, this alpha can be chosen, this alpha. Yeah, it can be chosen, yeah. How? Oh. 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 There, there in fact, it, it came from the linear response. So, uh, well, that's work done by, by Francesco. Uh, who, if, you, if you solve the beta cell beta equation, you, you have the theoretical spectrum, and in that case, the excitonic processes are, uh, are taken into account. So the, the way to uh, get the alpha is to solve the Dyson equation with different value of alpha, and to see which one is the best. Then the, the second uh, point was to, okay, we do the calculation, well, they did the calculation for, for several materials, and for some materials, it was shown that you can get a relation between the static dielectric constant obtained in RPA and the value of alpha, which gives a way uh, to, because if you have to do every time the beta cell beta calculation, it's, it's not very convenient, but that, that was an, an easy way to, to get a value of alpha. So in that case, we, we assumed that the value of alpha that was the best for the linear case should be the best for the, the second the second order. Yeah. So that's that's one way. Uh, of course, if we, we 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 change the value of alpha just to check, and in fact to work to to, to get a, the best result here was also obtained with this the same value of alpha. The fact that here we get only a good agreement for the main peak uh, is coming from different things. We, we think that here, it's the fact that the kernel is static. In principle, the kernel is a function of the frequency. Here we have the same value for all the frequency. First, because we don't have other possibilities to, to define approximation for, for this uh, frequency dependent kernel. Uh, and so we, we use the, the, the same. And uh, we have uh, checked that by using a kind of different kernel, we can uh, obtain a better agreement here. 
in, in this part, in the high frequencies part, it could be due to this GXC that is set equal to zero. Uh, it's difficult to have an approximation for the GX. Of course, we could use these experimental results, decide, okay, alpha is good. And so we try to get a good value for a good approximation for GXC by fitting the experimental results. Unfortunately, the, the FXC we have is already an approximation. And the effect of GXC is supposed to be small. So fixing G, a small quantity of GXC on a result where you have already implemented an approximation, I would not really trust the results. So for the moment, that's why we, we keep GXC equal to zero and uh, some work has still to be done on that case. So in this case, omega means uh, uh, the generated frequency? Or no, the it is the incoming frequency. So basically, you are resonantly driving the two excitons uh, and the gamma mass and the excitons are more or less there. Yeah. So it could be in GXC. <clears throat> you see, the fact that we, we, we don't have this GXC could decrease uh, the, the second of this, this part, the, the theoretical part. And so that we, we could have something that appears, I mean, because it's probably hidden somewhere. Uh, this is an example in a, on a more complicated material because gallium arsenide is quite simple. And so it's, can we, I, I told you at the beginning that it is second harmonic generation is a probe uh, for surface because uh, even in a central symmetric material, when you have a surface, this is a, symm a symmetry breaking. I mean, Below you have the material, above you have the vacuum. So that's the biggest symmetry breaking that you can imagine. And so even for materials that, was, that are central symmetric, you can have a second harmonic generation, which comes from a very thin layer uh, at the surface where the, 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 the atoms are organized in the surface. And uh, the, the, when, you, when you cut the material to, to have the surface, there are different uh, reconstruction which are possible. When you cut it, the, the atoms are not staying at the same position that they are in the bulk because the forces that are acting on the atoms are not the same due to the presence of the, of the vacuum above the, of the surface. And uh, it's important to know what kind of reconstruction we have. And a second harmonic generation is a way to probe this reconstruction because the signal is only coming from the atoms that have moved at the surface. So I'll show you some, uh, some result on a silicon surface, which is uh, covered with hydrogen. But that's the way the silicon surface are, are passivated. And uh, here we have several spectra, depending each on which direction the field is incoming and uh, in which direction the field is uh, outgoing. So the, the surface, the, the, the plane is in the XY in this notation, the plane of the surface is in the XY direction. And so perpendicular to the surface is the Z direction. And here is the result for the ZZZ component. So the two fields are coming perpendicular to the surface and the second harmonic is reflecting perpendicular to the surface. And we, we, we have two calculations here, one with the, the inclusion of the local field and one without the local field. We, you, you, you have seen that uh, for the case of gallium arsenide, the inclusion of local field was extremely disappointing. The local field are a signature of the inhomogeneities of the system, which means that they are quite weak in, gallium, in, in the bulk. Uh, at least for gallium arsenide. But uh, at the level of the surface, we can expect that the inhomogeneities are, are important because we have bulk and, and vacuum. And so that's exactly what we see here. Uh, you see that, that these two spectra are extremely different. 
with and without the local field. In fact, we have we have the feeling that by include, including the local fields, we, we just create new peaks. In fact, no, it's it's a bit more complicated. We cannot create any peaks, any new frequencies by including the, the, the local fields. It's just that we are changing the weight of some uh, points in the spectrum. And the, the change of the weight gives the, the feeling that we have more at low frequency than at high frequency. But it's, it's not new frequencies in, uh, coming from the, the, the local field. Now we have this case. So one uh, incoming field is in the plane of the surface and one is perpendicular to the surface and the field is emitting in the direction of the surface. And you see that here, they are very similar. Okay, so it, it's really uh, dependent, the influence of the local field in that case really depends on the direction you're looking at. And finally, we have this one where the two incoming fields are in the plane and one, the, the, the emitted field is perpendicular to the surface. And again, we have quite a different result with the two calculation. So it, it means that it's really the, the, the outgoing field, the emitted field, that is important for the importance of the, of the local field. Okay, and this will, will be the, the, the last example, that's the fish. It's not a fish. It's the electric field induced second uh, harmonic generation. So it's the same process that I told you with the linear electro-optic. I mean, it's a static field. So uh, electro-optic effect, you have one frequency, zero frequency. Here, it's second harmonic generation in the presence of a static field. So you have omega, omega coming from the laser and a zero frequency. And uh, so it means that it's a second harmonic, second harmonic generation because the, the final frequency is two omega, but it's in fact two omega plus zero, plus the zero that is coming from the, from the static field. And so it means that we have three photons. So it's a third order process. And we have a chi-3. So a chi-3, which is two photon omega and one photon zero. Okay, so that's second harmonic and that's efficient. So this is from the request of Kiri. He wanted to see what is uh, uh, so he was the chi three. He wanted to see what is what the chi three uh, looked like, but not only this. That's the end of the formula. <laughs> this is just for fun. And you don't have to calculate and to <laughs> look specifically in the in this case. So that's that's just the non-interacting response, and you have then to put that in a in a third order Dyson equation. Uh, and so uh, this is the, the result of a, a calculation, and uh, it's a comparison be between silicon and silicon carbide. And that was interesting because uh, silicon carbide is known as a nonlinear material because it can generate second harmonic generation, and silicon is known or is not used as a nonlinear material because this second harmonic is zero for silicon. And uh, so this, this example shows that in fact, silicon is a good nonlinear medium because you see that the, 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 the chi three, which is non-zero because all the odd number are non-zero for, for the, the nonlinear response. And so uh, the, the response for silicon at third order is much higher than the response at silicon carbide that is uh, known as a good nonlinear uh, material. And uh, so, uh, in fact, EFISH could be used as a way to probe silicon at a second harmonic uh, frequency uh, with a chi 3, which is, in fact, quite high. Okay. 
So there are some other other applications of uh, eFish, but I think I will stop here. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. And if you if you have questions, I will be happy to to answer. We, you we will uh, have this afternoon some hands on on tonight. Not on eFish. Only on second harmonic generation. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Don't run away. Okay. Yes. Uh, um, so the the the, the Kai two has a real part and an imaginary part. Uh, what is uh, plotted here? It's only the absolute value of the Kai two. Not we do not plot. Well, we could plot the real part and the imaginary part, but uh, we cannot assign any meaning to the two of them. Uh, for the linear case, we know that the imaginary part corresponds to absorption, and the real part is the usual refractive index. For for all the uh, even orders, there is no specific meanings or well, general meaning for the real part and the imaginary part. So we usually plot the, the absolute value. In the experiment also, they measure... Uh, well, yes, because in fact, they, what they measure is a number of photons which are emitted. And the number of photons is directly proportional, well, directly, is proportional to the, uh, the, 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 the modulus of the, of the guide. Yeah, so usually they, they, they do, just don't have access to the quantities uh, independently. It's just the, the square modulus. Is it also achievable the second harmonic generation via phonons? Yes. Yeah. Principle there is, but you know, if you want to to have a, a second order signature it has to be induced by a, an, an intense field and uh, with phonons uh, you, you can you can have uh, you can modify the second harmonic generation induced by the photons by the presence of phonons of course for instance if you if you perform the experiment uh, at zero frequency like the calculation at zero frequency, so without uh, phonons, and at higher frequency, you can have differences, of course, due to the presence of the of the, of the phonons. But it's it's difficult to take them into account. Yes. I was wondering because in principle there are some phonon modes which couple with the electric field. Yes. So yes. Yeah. we coupling it. But. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no there is no calculation like uh, like this. At least I've been sure. Maybe I may, I don't know. Maybe you can incorporate them uh, in a kind of I don't know for post processing. I, I don't know whether it's possible. I think that would be the, the simplest way to take them into account. Uh, whether it is possible or, or realistic, I'm not, I'm not sure. I've never done that. <laughs> I mean, the, all the experiments by Andrea Cavallieri in Hamburg uh, is uh, stuff that also, it's the guy that does uh, like induce uh, superconductivity. And the idea is somehow is that one that you excite uh, optically a phonon and you do stuff with that. And uh, you can do nonlinear phononics. Uh, because in, in principle, you only freeze the phonon at some time and then you calculate on that. No? And I think that's what I, no, mean, I, I don't know what they compute. They yeah. do expect them to expect. Yeah. Because they use toy models like cap or the non yes. yeah. yeah. I'm not so, sure that you can really do a initial calculation. Or maybe you don't even need that. I mean, maybe a toy model is, is enough, I don't know. Can you go to your slides that you were talking about with the second answer? Okay, maybe I can answer the question without the slide. 
And if you see the mass experiment, you get a wide range of frequency, not only odd order or odd coefficients of. It, in that case, it was only odd coefficients. Yes. Because you also said 400. Four, uh, yeah, around 400. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, that was the order of magnitude. Yes. Of course, it was not 400, it was 399 and 401. Ah, I have to go very slow. Yes, that's it. So what is the incoming field um, that produces this wide range of frequency? It was a laser. It was a, a titanium sapphire laser. So the incoming frequency was 1.5. Uh, it was done, well, uh, the, the, the experiments were done mainly on uh, rare gas atoms, so it was probably argon or, or neon, uh, but it was a very intense laser. Okay. So, ultrasound laser processes are related to yeah, uh, So, in fact, it shows high order harmonics were discovered by, by chance. So at the beginning, it was thought as a way to have a high frequency, much higher than what we people were able to produce with, with lasers. So it was a way to go in the, in the UV range, even X-ray uh, frequencies. So that was the, the, the first application. But then it turned out that there was a second application it was, it's the fact that if you select a part of the, of the spectrum, so if you select a certain number of frequencies, uh, something like 10 or 15 frequencies from the spectrum, and you, you, you recompress them, you use them, uh, what you get as a result, if you get the resulting output, uh, uh, the, the, out field, the output field, the, the width, the temporal width, so the duration of the pulse is extremely short. And the more you have frequencies, the shortest the, 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 the pulse is. In fact, it's something that you can see uh, analytically. If you take a sum of delta functions, so you have a, a finite sum of delta function, if you reconstruct the output, what you get is something which is broader but very short. So is that, that's exactly the, the same idea. Of course, the, the, the frequency width is, is very large. And so that's the way now that uh, attosecond pulses are created. So you, you, you start with a femtosecond pulse, select some of the frequencies, and then you get a, a high frequency, but attosecond pulse. Which can be used as a well, typically in in bomb probe experiments. They use it as a probe, a very short probe because at a second is at the level of the electronic motion, so it's ex extremely short. Is that applicable to Roman spectrum? Uh, you mean the calculation? Uh, I mean, the calculation and the, even the practical part also. I mean, for now, I'm on it's a laser. Well, for, for calculations, um, it, I, I think it, that there, is, there is a difficulty. It's the fact that in, in a Raman process, uh, that the, you, you have one absorption, which is to to, to, the, to the laser, yes. but the, the emitted photon is something that is uh, a spontaneous emission. Because the, the, the emitted photon is at the frequency which is related to the, to the difference between the energies, the energies of the of the system. So it's not a frequency that is present in the calculation in the in the uh, in the experiment. So you have you, you have different kinds of processes. You have an absorption. In absorption, photons have to be there. You have stimulated emission. So it's emission of a photon, which is in the mode of the laser. And you have spontaneous emission, which is a, a, the emission of a, a photon where you have no photon. So you just emit the photon. And the spontaneous emission uh, is a bit more difficult 
to, to calculate because here all the calculations are done in the, in the framework of what is called the semi-classical approximation. And it just means in fact, uh, that uh, the electric field is described as a cosine. It's a classical field. If you have a spontaneous, but it means this approximation is valid only if the number of photons present in the mode is extremely large. So it means that you have a laser at that frequency. And then you can describe the emission process with the, 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 the cosine for the electric field. When you have a spontaneous emission, it's emission of a photon where the number of, of photon in that mode is equal to zero. So it means that you cannot describe the field of the emitted photon in the classical approximation in, as a cosine. You have to go beyond this approximation and you have to do it in second quantization, which is much more difficult. Okay, so that, that, that's one of the, of the difficulty. So it can be done using, well, it, could, it, it is done usually in calculating the polarization, which gives access to the field that is emitted, but it's, it's more difficult. But in principle, it's a second order process, for sure. Yeah, because usually this is done by DFPT. Really, uh, yeah, but DFPT is more restricted to omega. Well, for instance, in Abinit, when it's DFPT, yes. it's it's more related to static processes. Mm -hmm. okay. So you have the Raman frequency, but more or less at omega equals zero, and you 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 uh, you, you use it as a at the, in the low part of the spectrum the value of the susceptibilities that do not really depend on the frequency. There is a flat part of the spectrum. So if you calculate at zero frequency, it's a bit further, it's, it's, it's more or less the same frequency. That's why a static susceptibility can be used in fact. It's just when you go outside this range, for instance, if you start to go uh, outside the gap where you have absorption, it of course this approximation breaks down and you really have to calculate the dynamical response of the uh, for going back to the earlier last night, uh, for the G, it's, uh, uh, the G C, yeah. uh, except that this one might be very small, do you have any clue, any idea of which type of form it can take? In fact, well, if you, if you take the FXC, the long range approximation for the FXC, you can show analytically that it has to go as alpha, some quantities divided by Q square. In, in the, for optical processors, I mean, when Q goes to zero, the, the chi 2 is proportional to Q square. And so it has to be, the, the, the FEC has to be something divided by Q square. Not more, not less. If it's more, it's divergent than Q going to zero, which is not good. If it's less, so if it's alpha divided by Q, then you do not compensate this Q square. So for the same reason, uh, you can, looking at the part of the Dyson equation where you have this GXC, you have three response, you, you have in response function that shows that there will be proportional Q to Q to the power three. So the GXC, if you do something like the long range kernel, which means something divided by Q to the power of whatever, it has to be three. So if the same kind of approximation would be, we called it beta divided by Q3. But it, uh, we, we, we did the calculation <laughs> just, just to see. It was, it was not really successful. I mean, we did not improve anything. And especially we could not find any way of uh, finding better. The, the, I think the, the, what we need is a, a very accurate second order beta sub beta calculation, for instance. Uh, so that we could play with the two <coughs> and see whether we can 
find something that, but we do not have any experimental results so that we could fit them with, a, with this kind of uh, kernel. But maybe this, this approximation would be wrong. I mean, it, it works fine for the, for the second, for, for the linear case. It seems that it was, works fine for the FXC. Is it a good approximation for the GXC? There is absolutely no, 